Here's Sauce Gardner. I was in Vegas, and long story short, somebody did a card trick, and I'm a million percent that the cards were in my palms. At the end, he said, now it's a block of glass. Move your hand, and a block of glass was in my hands instead of the cards. I'm not going back to Vegas. <laughs> That's great. That's great. But, I mean, he was in the room when O's the Mentalist did all of his voodoo stuff, whatever that was, and ultimately was right when he called up Nicole Hartman and said, Who's your team playing in the Super Bowl? And he said the 49ers. And he was right. And he was more right than anybody would have recognized. Nicole Hardman's team did beat the 49ers in the Super Bowl. So O's, check mark for you. Um, that leads to our first question in today's PFT mailbag. Our good friend Tom Marshall, A Red Zona UK, who was in Las Vegas for the Super Bowl. Could Vegas eventually knock out one of the traditional Super Bowl cities from contention like Tampa or Phoenix? It was great fun as long as you didn't drive on the strip after 3 p.m. You know, we talk about a rotation, but it never really settles into a rotation because there's always a city that you don't think is in the rotation that ends up in contention like Atlanta. Arthur Blank said last week, we wrote about this yesterday or the day before, he told Dan Kaplan of frontofficesports.com, that they're looking at the Super Bowl for 2028 or 2029. The way it works now, they approach you. It's not a bidding process anymore where all the cities come to the table. So if they're talking to the NFL about it, the NFL's already decided we'll go back to Atlanta. So I don't know what the rotation is. L.A., Las Vegas, Miami, well, Arizona, and then there's New Orleans from time to time. But It's been 12 years for New Orleans, but they're in the rotation, aren't they? And then there's Houston that pops up, and then you got Atlanta, and then you got the quid pro quo whenever Mm – you know, some government is willing to defy the will of the people and pay a billion dollars for a stadium, they get one too. I bet we'll be back in Jacksonville one of these days, despite the lack of adequate hotel space where they had to bring in cruise ships. This was before I was going to Super Bowls, but they're going to kick in a billion dollars for a modified and renovated stadium in Jacksonville. They may get another one. Minnesota got yeah. one every time they got a new stadium. Detroit got one with every new stadium. So I don't know what the rotation is, but there's no way there can be a rotation without Las Vegas. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I thought Las Vegas did a great job of hosting it. The, the one problem, and I was talking to somebody from Vegas about this, is that you, know, you don't have the public transportation infrastructure on the Strip. And if you got, like, a tram that just went from, I don't know, around Mandalay Bay all the way down, like the um, Las Vegas Boulevard, boy, that would really help. So that's something that maybe Vegas needs to think about. But, I, I mean, I had a great time in Las Vegas. I love that it was centralized. And that, you know, you can, you didn't, especially because where we were saying, you really didn't have to walk very far in order to get to what you were doing. But yeah, I mean, Nashville is another one of those places, you know, once they get their new stadium, I would expect that we'll be there for a Super Bowl too. There have been occasions where after I left a Super Bowl host city, my opinion was it should be there every year. And Mm -hmm. there are two now on my list where I could say it should be there every year, Miami and Las Vegas. And I think, You know, the first time in Vegas was one of the reasons why there were so many people there because there were so many people that came just to be in Las Vegas in the days preceding the Super Bowl. And then they left. A lot of people left on Saturday night or Sunday morning. They didn't go to the game. They just came to be in Vegas. The next time in Vegas, there'll be less novelty. There'll be less sizzle and there'll be less people, I think. But I'd say Miami or Vegas, like they need to work something where you get to Miami and Las Vegas more often than they do. And I know you would want it to be in Los Angeles as often as possible no. so you don't have to, you know. Yeah, I I'm mean, not you. A lot of people I like love traveling. that stadium. Yeah. The, I, the, I doesn't feel, like, it didn't feel like a Super Bowl to me when traveling. it was here because I, it, was just, it was just going to work. I, I, go to, I go to SoFi all the time. I go there for Rams games, Chargers games, concerts. Like, nah, I, like but put it somewhere else. I mean, I know it's coming back here soon, but, then, but like, I, I, I want to go somewhere. Like, I was surprised San Francisco got another one with all that spread out. Me too, like, honestly. You know, the, the, the media activities in San Francisco and the stadium's two hours away or whatever it is in traffic. <laughs> like, I, I think one of the reasons they got it when they got it was because some of the other candidates, like L.A., you know, they're, they're hosting World Cup games and there wasn't a clamoring to try to host the Super Bowl that year. That's what opened the door for Levi's Stadium. But I I didn't mention them as part of this rotation. I don't think there is a rotation, but there needs to be one. And Las Vegas and Miami need to be on it. And New Orleans. And New Orleans. Yes. It shouldn't be 12 years between Super Bowls for New Orleans. And it wouldn't have been 12 years 
I think it was going to be this year, but it butted up right against Mardi Gras, mm-hmm. given the Easter calendar that I can never figure out when Easter is going to be. But this wasn't a good year, so they were able to kick it to next year. All right, we'll kick it to the next question. David Boston, forget running and scrambling, just looking at pure arm talent. Who are you taking? Josh Allen and Mahomes or John Elway and Dan Marino? It looks like we got to take them both together. So who are you taking? Hmm. Allen and Mahomes or Elway and Marino? Arm talent only. I mean, this is not really a, a fair question. I mean, like, I, I, I never saw Elway and Marino play. So it's, and as I've seen highlights, but it's not the same as, you know, like my professional career has been covering Patrick Mahomes and Josh Allen. So it's like, I, I, I would have to toss this question because there's no, I can't pick Elway because I never really saw him. You know, like, that's not, what would you say? Well, if we're going to look at pure arm talent, Elway and Marino, just because Marino's arm talent was off the charts, off the yeah. charts. I remember interviewing at one of the Super Bowls about how he got that quick release. It was something his dad taught him at a young age. Like, hey, if you and it, it's instinctive. If you want to be the best possible thrower of a football that you can, the less time you give people to react to what you're doing, the more effective you're going to be. You still have to deliver the ball with velocity and accuracy. But if you can get rid of the thing like a Cobra strike, that's going to be an advantage. And it ended up being a huge advantage. Now, Mahomes is special because he can go from any platform. He can go from any arm angle. He's a shortstop playing quarterback at the highest possible level. I mean, if I, I – yeah, so that's what makes it difficult. And they're, they're all great. They're all great. But yeah. Marino, if we're just talking about arm talent. That lightning fast release – that that would make him an Elway just above Mahomes and Allen. But Mahomes is a level of special that, number one, we still haven't seen fully bloom for all of his career. Like, right. we're, we're, he's only six years in as a starter, and we already have him in the pantheon of all-time great quarterbacks. He's not going to just fall off the face of the earth. He's not going to go Steve Blass. If you want a dated reference that takes you to baseball, he's not just going to all of a sudden lose it. He's only going to get better. So th- th- it's right. it's. It's, I don't want to say it's pointless at this point, but both of them. I mean, by the time Alan Mahomes are done, we may say both of them, but it's going to be yeah. largely because Mahomes is just getting started, in my opinion. Well, yeah, and I, I don't know. I, I would, if we're talking about just pure arm talent, right? I, I was in the stadium. This is when I used to work for the Rams, and we used to have access to it, um, the workouts, right? And so I would kind of like sneak into the bowl and watch um, in Lucas Oil Stadium when the quarterbacks would start throwing. And I remember Josh Allen just like dropping back and just yeeting that thing down the field. I mean, it was going like 60, 70 yards. So, I mean, we know that he can throw a ball down the field as well as anybody. I mean, Steph Diggs catches that long pass down the right sideline. We may not be talking about Kansas City as Super Bowl champions. Who knows? But yeah, I, I, I think that both of those dudes have great arm talent when you're talking about Josh Allen and Patrick Mahomes. And so... I mean, if you're talking about guys that obviously know how to throw a football and do it very well, I mean, you know, look, John Elway led the drive and disappointed my family greatly. So it's not like he doesn't have arm talent either. I guess Jim Kelly is another one where I think of like those sort of older school quarterbacks, like when I was a baby that were really, really up there. You talk about the K gun. That's that's something that I also would think about as a guy with like pure just arm talent and can yeet it around the field. Jordan Davey asks this question. Do you think Dak Prescott has enough leverage to command a fully guaranteed contract similar to Deshaun Watson? Dak Prescott has a ton of leverage, and Jerry Jones will never admit how much leverage Dak Prescott has. (laughs) Dak Prescott has the kind of leverage that Jerry Jones would have utilized and exploited to the fullest possible extent in any business dealing he ever did. And it's all (laughs) Jerry Jones' fault. They didn't pay Dak after three years. They didn't pay him after four years. And then after five years, they realized he had them over a barrel because all he had to do was one more year under the franchise tag. And then he walks away like Kirk Cousins walked away from Washington. They replaced the second year of the franchise tag with a four-year, $160 million contract that was structured in a way to force the Cowboys to redo it now because his cap number is $59.4 million. And if they don't redo it now, he can walk away with no ability to keep him with that $59.4 million cap charge this year and $35 million plus in dead money next year. He's got more than $90 million over the next two years without an extension that plays games and moves money around and pushes cap dollars. So 
He he has leverage to do whatever he wants to do. He is only going to be limited by his own conscience in how far he is taking this and how many cap dollars he's leaving behind to have a team around him. That is the only limitation on how far he wants to take this. Yeah, it's true. And, you know, you talk about having somebody over a barrel. I mean, look, the way Dak Prescott has played this has absolutely benefited his financial present and future. So if you're the Cowboys, are you inclined to sort of get start setting that precedent, right? Where, you know, we've said that the Deshaun Watson contract is an outlier. And at this point it is. Um, but if you are Dak Prescott and you want to force the issue and deadlines spur action, right? So the, this has to be done soon. Um, this is something that, yeah, you, you might want to think about, but I don't, I don't know that Jerry Jones is going to be very inclined to give Dak Prescott a fully guaranteed contract. I think he's going to want to do everything in his power to not do that so that he's not setting that kind of precedent for other teams. Cause you know, even though well, they don't, they don't have to, they don't have to openly collude to collude. Right. So it's like, you don't want to be that guy. Right. Here's the other side of it too. Most quarterback contracts are as a practical matter guaranteed fully. And the way they right. could structure this, even if it's not fully guaranteed, it is fully guaranteed. I mean, the four years, $160 million, fully guaranteed as a practical matter because they're not going to cut him. The structure can make it impossible to cut a guy, so it is guaranteed. It doesn't have to be. That's what was so weird about it. They didn't have to do it. The Browns didn't have to make it all fully guaranteed to still make it fully guaranteed as a practical matter. All right, one more real quick. Tatum in Pittsburgh. I'm intrigued by this. What happens first? An expansion team in a new domestic market or an expansion slash current team permanently moved into an international market, and how soon could any of those scenarios take place? Well, this is easy if I look at it technically because if they expand, it's not going to be one team. It's going to be two. Right. You can't just yes. add one team. You can't, ha you can't do that because then one team is on a buy every week of the season. That's not going to work. You have to have two. The more likely scenario here, sorry, folks in Jacksonville, as of right now, until we have the paperwork signed, sealed, and delivered – to get a billion dollars in taxpayer money to renovate the stadium there, the obvious alternative that they don't even have to mention is you don't give us what we want, we'll just move the team to London where we have a place where we play games every year. That's, that's a no-brainer. So between the two, if you have to give me one or the other, it's relocation of the Jaguars to London. Not saying they will, not saying they should, but we can't be naive to what's staring us right in the face. If they don't get what they want in Jacksonville – they're going to take the team to London. Yeah, uh, but I the, but that's that's relocation. That's not expansion, right? If we're talking purely expansion, no, but, then, but it's it. But that's the question: expansion or current team permanently moved into an international market? That was the question. Uh, yes, expansion uh, or right. current. Yes. Okay. Sorry, I I misread the question. But I I think that yes. either way, it's if you're going to say okay, we're going to expand the league, as you said, you, you can't just do one. And I think it would be one. that. Right. So you would probably do both, right? If you're going to expand the league, you are probably going to say we're getting into a new domestic market and we're getting into an international market somewhere, right? Whether that's London, whether maybe it's Canada, you know, maybe put team Mexico. I don't know, but like that to me is where that would happen. And depending on what happens with Jacksonville, that could happen sooner than later. I mean, if you're talking about expansion, I don't think that would be until like something like eight to 10 years, but depending on what happens in Jacksonville, then relocation, that could be more like four to five. Am I off? Well, let me just be clear on this too. I'm only answering the question about expansion. I did say at one point during the season, after quarterbacks were dropping left and right, if I ever mention expansion again, punch me in the face. Because I thought the NFL <laughs> would, in order to increase inventory, because they're never going to get to 18 games. Unless they decide we're going to lock out the players and we're going to make them cry uncle at the next CBA talks at the end of the decade, early next decade, and we're going to get to 18 regular season games, which would be a mistake to do. I don't think the human body can take it. The only way to increase inventory of games is to expand. Yes. There aren't enough quarterbacks. There aren't no. enough quarterbacks. There weren't enough for 32 teams this year. There aren't going to be enough for 34, 36, 38, or 40. So, uh, Expansion is going to be a tough sell. So of those options, yeah, if they don't give the Jaguars what they want in the next couple of years, maybe sooner, that ship literally is going to sail across the Atlantic Ocean to England. And Jaguars fans, you can get mad at me. for I, I remember 
Folks in St. Louis used to get mad at me when I would say you're going to lose the Rams. You don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what you're talking about. Quit making shit up. That's what I'd hear. And then when the Rams left, you know, what was it? It was crickets coming out of St. Louis because they were too busy mad at the Rams to be mad at me for being right. And they should have, you know, not, I don't know what they could have done because Dan Kroenke seemed to be determined to move that team. Jacksonville's got a position and this is how it works. This is stadium economics. This is how the game is played. You better cough up the money. It's a nice football team you got there. It'd be a shame if you lose it. That's the message that the Jaguars are currently sending to Jacksonville. Hi, it's Mike Florio. Thanks for watching PFT on YouTube. Hit subscribe for the latest news and analysis from Pro Football Talk.